Hare Krishna, everyone. Please accept my humble obeisance. He's all going to Prabhupada. We're going to start our program in just a minute. Let's begin with some pranams and opening prayers. Jama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Vestaya Bhutale Shumati Bhakti Vinata Swami Nityananda Namaste Saraswati Devi Om Mahi Pichavari Nirvishesha Shanyavari Vasta Jami Sukhari Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gauru Bhakti Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 so we want to thank the devotees that are joining us here today. We have a few devotees who are members of the North American Council, the leadership team who are here with us on Zoom, and many devotees who are joining in on YouTube. So appreciate all of you being with us. My name is Anuj Madas. I've been asked to host this uh, this session, which we will be. Uh, discussing and, and hearing from uh, Niranjan Swami about the situation that is going on in Ukraine from the perspective of the Hare Krishna devotees and the Hare Krishna Society there in Ukraine. Um, I serve as the communications minister of ISKCON and uh, a GBC colleague of Maharaj, so I'm very honored to be with him and have a chance to speak with him and uh, shed some light on this uh, very difficult situation that's existing for many people, including a lot of devotees that are there in Ukraine. So Maharaj, thank you very much for being with us today. I think almost everyone here will probably know Maharaj and his background, but just very briefly, Maharaj has been a member of ISKCON since 1973. He accepted the Sannyas Order of Life, or Renunciate Order, uh, in 1986, and he's actually been active in preaching and visiting in Ukraine since 1989. So he has many decades of background there in the Ukraine, and he's currently serving the preachers in the Ukraine, and he's the governing body commissioner of the Ukraine. So, Mars, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Anuj Mukhubu, for inviting me. And, Mars, I think you're muted. So okay, I'm sorry about that. I don't know how it happened, but I probably did it inadvertently. Thank you very much for inviting me, Anuj Mukhubu. I'm very honored to be uh, given this opportunity to speak with you. And I thank Kalaji Mukhubu also for initiating this um, this uh, interview as well. Maraj, what, what part of the world are you in right now? I think you recently were in Ukraine, if I understand. I was in Ukraine last week. Yeah, what I've done is uh, I, I kind of spent, I'm spending time in, in Budapest. That's where I'm right now, because the only way to get into Ukraine is by driving. So uh, I was in I drove to Ukraine uh, a little over a week ago. I spent several days, days there for a retreat, an event with devotees, and I've done it a couple of times, and I hope to do it more because it's impossible to fly into Ukraine. So Shiva Maharaj has very kindly given me his office to use as a base to, to go back and forth between here and Ukraine. Yeah, and interesting because Hungary actually has been a base for a lot of the ISKCON support. We'll talk about later. A lot of the ISKCON support for devotees in the Ukraine and, and other people, refugees from Ukraine, have, uh, have have been directed and directed by devotees in Hungary. So appropriate place for you to be. Very, very appropriate. So Maraj, maybe just for a little bit of a background. Um, I know I, I've traveled quite a bit around the ISKCON world, but I've never been to Ukraine. And I'm sure a lot of devotees haven't. Maybe you can tell us a little bit kind of the history of ISKCON's presence in the Ukraine and of our preaching work there, just kind of get us up to maybe, you know, pre a couple of years ago, you know, pre mil quote, military conflict. What, what, what's our history there and, and maybe even how you got involved? Um, well, actually, the history goes back uh, certainly before my time. I was simply uh, riding on the crest of the wave of, of, of the work that was done by the former preachers in the former Soviet Union who actually had been the, the catalyst to establish book distribution and of course first and foremost was Srila Prabhupada in 1971 and uh, and uh, I personally got and when I went in 1989 I personally got to see what Prabhupada's visit in 1971 had actually accomplished and and to see also subsequently what his books had done to change people's lives in fact, I have to confess that one of the 
greatest inspirations that I had when I was visiting the former Soviet Union during communist times was just how much Srila Prabhupada's books were transforming people's lives because uh, they were just so eager for something, a divine message, and Prabhupada had the most divine message to distribute. And the devotees, of course, as is well known, risked their lives for for printing them and for and for and for distributing them. And uh, in my very first visits to the former Soviet Union in the late 1980s, I saw how they had stocked their books. And uh, I, one of the things that really inspired me the most was reading the letters. I used to spend time in the office where the book publication was going on, and I used to cull through all the different letters they had received from people who had read Prabhupada's books. And um, in fact, I still have some. I have hundreds of them. They were written back in the in the late 1980s. Just stories. People just their their hearts just so melted, so happy to know that Krishna exists. <laughs> and uh, that was sort of like I came in on the as I say on the crest of the wave in 1989. Uh, Kirti Raj and Hari K. Swami, of course, had made their contribution. And uh, I oftentimes say that Kirti Raj Prabhu is is an unsung hero for establishing Krishna consciousness in the former Soviet Union. And I, I really feel that, and I feel so indebted to him and devotees to this very day, who from the early days, who remember him, always remember him so fondly and uh, so appreciatively of the kind of sacrifices he made for them. And unfortunately, not many devotees know about that. So from time to time, I always try to remind them that uh, of how much indebted they should be for his the work that he had actually done in those early years. So I just came in at the request of Kirti Raj. Uh, they were looking for somebody to, uh, to who could go to the former Soviet Union. And it was at that time, it was still under communist rule. And uh, it was to go, I had to go as a tourist and the uh, they were very expensive. And it just so happened that the one person that I knew uh, who lives in Los Angeles now, is, uh, his name is Charlie Gear. Uh, he had met the devotees and he was very interested in, uh, in going there. And uh, I said, why don't you go? And he said, I'll go, but I won't go without you. So I contacted uh, Kirti Raj and Kirti Raj said, we're just now looking for somebody who will go and Charlie Gear sponsored my trips during the Soviet times as a tourist. Uh, so many of the trips and, and came along with me. And I have so many photos that he had taken in those early visits back in the former Soviet times. And uh, they are very precious for me. <laughs> I know Charlie, but I didn't know that part of his history. And, and, and a lot of us old timers know about Kirti Raj's contributions, but I'm glad you highlighted that today because more devotees should know about the sacrifices that went on from people outside. What to speak of the devotees were living under that Soviet regime. So uh, yeah, that's important. Tell us how, th how did things develop then, Marash, in the Ukraine, you know, get, in, in Ukraine, get us up to the point of, you know, before this conflict arose and for a lot of devotees around the world, and I think for a lot of people around the world, Ukraine was not necessarily on the radar so much, but we know there'd been tremendous amount of growth there and a, a pretty significant presence of devotees and temples in Ukraine. Uh, yes, well, uh, from the time I began visiting, uh, I was, I think about two years passed, and then Kirt and when things opened up in 1991, Kirti Raj at that particular point decided that uh, he had sacrificed at least a decade or more for the uh, Soviet preaching, and that his children at that time, he confessed, didn't even know they had a father. As, he, as how he described his family situation. And uh, he was thinking it was probably time for him to uh, uh, to spend more time with his family and, uh, and to take up some other initiatives that he could do from a distance rather than uh, work that he had done up until that point. So he asked those of us who were visiting the Soviet Union if we would take over various areas of responsibility. And it was his... Uh, 
initiative to uh, to give uh, different countries and different parts of Russia to the different leaders at the time. And he requested me uh, at that time uh, if I would become the GBC of Ukraine. I had been visiting it. Uh, I had already established a relationship with the leader, Achyuta Priyadas, who had been active in Krishna consciousness since the early 1980s. Uh, he was, uh, uh, I already knew him well. We, we bonded well. And uh, so I continued from that point on, 1991, as the GBC of Ukraine. And uh, of course, I was visiting other countries as well. Uh, but with, because our focus is Ukraine, I'll, I'll just stick with Ukraine. But I, definitely I was visiting Russia. I was visiting uh, the Baltic countries. And I was at one time for the first maybe five or six years after the fall of communism, I was visiting approximately 90 cities a year uh, throughout the former Soviet Union. It was quite <laughs> a lot of traveling. <laughs> but then I, gradually I focused on Ukraine and one of the initiatives that I became inspired to do in Ukraine, uh, with the inspiration that I got from visiting Chalpati and Radhanath Maharaj in the early 90s when I started to go there to Chalpati, is I felt it was an uh, initiative was the establishing of a system of devotee care. So uh, that started the the seed was planted in the late 1990s i'd say maybe somewhere around 1997 uh, uh when uh, we started the devotee care but it took many years many many years for it to get off the ground um, and i realized that sometimes it was, it was there was a misunderstanding of what the devotee care system was some people were thinking it was it was a I, I I created it to take care of my disciples or something. I don't know. There were different ideas of what it was, which was completely had no connection to, of a system that I created to take care of my disciples. It was something that I was I felt it needed to be done because so many devotees were joining, and uh, I had the experience of the past of seeing many devotees joining. And unfortunately, seeing ISKCON as to be like a revolving door, watching people leave was probably one of the most painful experiences that I had gone through in my early years of preaching as a sannyasi, uh, in both in, in, in many places where I had been traveling. So I felt that this was a, this devotee care was something to try to inhibit or to restrict or restrain the revolving door phenomena to give a long-term vision of how devotees can feel connected to Prabhupada's mission throughout their whole life. So uh, it was started in, uh, in the 1997, and uh, it took several years for me to kind of really preach it. And the, fortunately for me is that Shuta Priya understood it. It really took hold in his heart. And I can say, with confidence that I'm just, I'm just watching how things evolved by his hard work in establishing this system in Ukraine. And uh, Marge, tell us what, what, what's some of the results of that. I mean, you know, because I think a lot of us don't really have a sense how many communities are in Ukraine, how many Bakhtar riches or whatever, you know, category of home programs. Are there schools, temples, deities, farms? I, I know it's a large presence there, but uh, give us give us some sense of that. Well, be, it's because we're really we're, our focus of development was really grassroots, and uh, we really avoided the phenomenon of building big temples with funds from outside. We wanted them to be organic development and focus on people first, and projects would evolve naturally. When, when the inspiration was there on a local basis. So because of that, uh, gradually over time, I'd say there was Ukraine, as it was, had uh, 25, about 25 temples. Uh, and uh, it gradually evolved. I think there's about 300 and, 360 Namhatas or that were just prior to the war that were going on throughout Ukraine. And we had done... Uh, an assessment that in 2000, I think it was 2013 was the last big uh, festival that we had 
um, which the Bhakti Sangama festival just before the the conflict began in 2014. And at that festival, uh, attendance was 14,000 devotees. And, uh, and most of them, uh, there were some from other countries, but most of them were from the Ukraine region. And gradually we begin to calculate over time that, that uh, there was about 20,000 devotees, practicing devotees in Ukraine. And, uh, and, uh, there are, as I said, we were up to about, about 25 temples that organically manifested by the local, local devotees doing, donating funds in some cases, like in the Kiev temple, the devotees did most of the construction themselves. It's a seven story building, but it was built mostly by devotees and, and even most of the materials were, were acquired by going to the various factories and, and just begging <laughs> begging mm -hmm. for bricks begging for cement concrete the, the, the one devotee used to go out in the street and she used to flag down cranes and 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 for prasadam she would invite the, the cranes to come to lift the concrete slabs to gradually build the temple and that's how the ukraine uh, the kiev temple uh, was how it began the construction began in 1991 and uh <laughs> still going on because it's it's like that. But uh, 20,000 devotees, uh, about 360 namhatas and, uh, and, and counselor groups. And even in Kiev today, uh, before the conflict, there were about 96 groups meeting outside the temple. And uh, although many devotees left uh, be when the conflict began, some have returned. And even actively right now, there are 80 groups in Kiev who are meeting mostly online. And that's one of the initiatives that they did is to how to keep the devotees who had left group Ukraine connected with their particular close groups that they had developed friendly relationships with, trusting relationships with. And uh, in fact, I have to say that, I mean, all credit again, I go to Ajuta Priya and the devotees who are assisting him but in the, my course of travels to, through Europe and where I have met devotees who have forced to flee, mostly women and children, I would say about maybe 90% of them have told me, at least 90% have told me that their main connection is with their, their groups who are still in Ukraine. That's their connection. That's their nourishment. That's their uh, pushti tushti. <laughs> nourishment and satisfaction that they're getting is through the sanghas that the, that were established locally and they kind of tried to keep it connected uh, through uh, online, through Zoom. They had two years opportunity to become a, a Zoom conscious <laughs> uh, for association and uh, therefore when the conflict began they just continued to do that although for many it was quite traumatic in the beginning. And uh, I'll probably have to, at some point, address some of those topics about the trauma that took place in the lives of many of the devotees as a result of the conflict. Well, just tell us a little more about, the, about at least some of the direct impact in terms of, you know, we know we were seeing, I mean, so much uh, horrendous video footage of apartment complexes being destroyed and homes being destroyed. And of course, thousands of people fleeing the country. And we know in different countries, uh, Hungary, you mentioned before, Romania and Poland, devotees were there, you know, assisting this kind of devotees who left the country and also other refugees. It, tell us a little more about the impact. How many, do we have some sense of these 20,000 devotees, how many of them had to relocate and are they back home, most of them now, or they all had to leave, you know, some of the eastern areas of the country? What, what's, what's happening on the ground now? I would say, I, I don't, we don't have statistics. Uh, it would be very difficult to gather statistics because, I mean, m there are devotees who are just independently and understandably so had to, to leave uh, Ukraine at the time when the conflict began. And uh, one of the things that I was uh, privy to is that there was a devotees in Europe, in Western Europe, who saw the huge influx of Ukrainian refugees. And uh, basically, I had uh, had 
I spoke to the GBC, I think, even and, and when I was giving a GBC report saying that, you know, my hands are full for what's going on in Ukraine. If some of the leaders in, in Europe take up the initiative, there'll be a lot of work that needs to be done to facilitate and accommodate the large numbers of devotees who are leaving. And of course, most of them were women and children because males couldn't leave from any, from 18 to 60. Males were not allowed to, ages 18 to 60, but they're not allowed to leave Ukraine. So many of the women and children had to, to leave. And, uh, and uh, I was uh, it's very enlivened and encouraged to see that there were many devotees and I give all credit to them for their uh, for their willingness and sacrifices they made. I, I should mention one devotee, her name is Sukanti Radha from England, and she did so much, uh, so much to try to uh, mobilize uh, the devotees for, uh, and amongst the different temples uh, to uh, give them some kind of vision of how to facilitate the influx of refugees. And she was working gradually began working with myself and with Pragosh Prabhu. And uh, uh, she was helping to facilitate devotees who are looking for ways to get out of Ukraine. She had ways to do that. And uh, although I can't disclose how it was done, she had connections and uh, she was working with one of the devotees who are, uh, who still even to this day, he's the coordinator of, uh, of uh, evacuations. Because on the front lines in some of the cities and the front lines, there are devotees who still need to evacuate. Um, and uh, they need to either go to Western Ukraine, which many of them are doing, or some of them, they are going, they have, go they have gone to Europe. I will say that the large numbers of devotees who left in the, towards the beginning of the conflict, of them, many of them have returned. Uh, they have returned because they didn't feel that uh, they felt although that Ukraine was unpredictable they also felt that being in Europe was unpredictable and uh, many of them were really uh, they needed they needed to go back their their husbands were there they couldn't leave and that's why we try to create in the western part of Ukraine we tried to create play, our centers as a place where families could go so that the, that the women and children could stay within Ukraine with the husbands and the fathers. So that's why some of our centers in Ukraine became refugee, our temples in Ukraine, places where refugee families would go and would be accommodated to try to minimize the number of uh, devotees going into Europe and being without a husband and the children being without their father. So that initiative kind of happened naturally, organically, spontaneously. And uh, that's also being supported uh, by, uh, by uh, those centers in, uh, in North America. For instance, uh, Iskon Silicon Valley has come forward uh, to sponsor uh, all the refugees who are living in our retreat center called Magdalenovka, New, uh, New Mayapur, it's called, where there are about 200 refugees there, families, women, and children who've left everything behind. They were mostly from Kharkiv, uh, but from many other cities that were heavily destroyed. And uh, this kind of Silicon Valley gives a monthly donation to support the refugees there. The Canadian devotees took an initiative uh, to uh, to uh, support the refugees who are in the city of Lviv in western Ukraine, where there are many also families uh, who have uh, been given shelter, and they are also supporting them. And of course, there are many devotees throughout Ukraine who can't evacuate, who can't leave. Um, either they have elderly parents, uh, they have no place to go, uh, it's, they have families, it's difficult for them to move a husband and wife with children to live communally. It's not always so easy. Those who left the eastern parts of Ukraine, mostly as a whole family, they did so because they lost everything. I mean, there are stories of uh, one devotee who was on the front line where 
the Chutapriya was oftentimes calling them, suggesting that they should probably consider sheltering elsewhere because the conflict was increasing. And the, two days after he left, a, a missile went right through his flat. And the people on both sides of the flat were killed. But because he left, uh, fortunately, Krishna has protected them. And I, I just checked with the Chutapriya a couple of days ago. Amongst the devotee population, there have been no casualties of the conflict. No casualties of the of devotees. I mean, nobody's lost. There has been injuries. Uh, the only casualties were those devotees who had to go to the front lines and fight. And uh, there's uh, under 10 we have been lost. But uh, as those who are not fighting on the front lines, there have been no casualties, although definitely some devotees have been injured. So no no devotee no devotee civilian deaths, although some have been injured. But you say about about ten of the devotees that were serving in the military have passed away. I think uh, I think the, the figure is nine. Less, I think nine. Yes. Less than ten. Less than ten. Um, one thing I just want to mention to the devotees that are are watching this live, um, if you'd like to, we, we're going to be having some uh, opportunity for additional questions to Maharaj and you can put your questions in the YouTube live chat and then they will be relayed from there to me so we can uh, try to open up for some other questions in addition to the, to the few I still have. Maharaj, you specifically mentioned Silicon Valley. Uh, that's wonderful to hear that they're sponsoring um, New Mayapur in Western Ukraine and you mentioned that the Canadian devotees are, are sponsoring the devotees in Lviv, if I put Yes, it right. Lviv. Yes, correct. It's my poor notes. Um, what are some of the other things? Because I know devotees, a lot of times, you know, there's kind of an outpouring of, of support and concern when it first reaches our attention. But the way things work in this world, you know, another, <laughs> there's another wave of crisis, you know, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado or a death in the family or, or you know, something else. And it sometimes we, we lose our focus. Um, it sounds like there's still a need for help, and, and I, we want to come back to this later, but at this point in the conversation, I think it's a good time to just say, what can devotees do that would like to help? How, is, would, how can they reach out? How can they help? How can they, maybe there's other communities that could be sponsored. You mentioned there were several that now have a lot of devotee refugees from various parts of the country that are in some of our Western communities, and maybe there's others that could use some sponsorship as well. Yes, uh, in fact, I think it would be a good opportunity to at least say that there, right now there's about 21 devotee volunteers who are part of your, the Share Your Share Your Care team. They've all been working selflessly and tirelessly uh, to, uh, to maintain this Share Your Care team project. Uh, and uh, beginning from the project coordinator to... Uh, you know, to helping with the communications, helping with producing videos, uh, at, at fund, fundraising, and keeping records of all the funds and dispersing disbursement of funds uh, to devotees in need. To date, I think somewhere around, I think 2,800 devotees have received emergency financial assistance as a result of the funds which have been raised worldwide. Uh, it's quite a substantial number, and uh, I I have access to the uh, to the spreadsheet, and I can say that even as of uh, November first, I think that November first there were about fourteen new requests from devotees. They're coming in regularly, uh, describing situations that uh, harrowing, you know of of of. Uh, of no, no money, uh, no employment, especially devotees who are in occupied cities where, where the, they have no employment, no work, no means of income. Uh, there's no medicines. Uh, food is accessible, but they, to buy food, they need money. And, uh, and uh, some devotees are described uh, in the cities, in these cities, their flats were destroyed. And uh, so, even the, as of November 1st, like 14 requests came from different devotees, families, family. One came from a devotee who lost her husband. 
uh, and he was fighting on the front lines. She had to move and she has no support. And the husband, when he, he, the child was, uh, was two weeks old <laughs> and they were in Mariupol at the time and they were living in the basement at, at that time, back in the early days of the, of the conflict, they were living in the basement with no food, no electricity, no gas. They were melting snow for water. And uh, they did that for six weeks. And then they had to flee to go someplace else. And then the husband went in to, the, was, uh, to fight and he was killed. And now she, she has no support. And that just came in recently uh, as a request for assistance. Uh, another devotee put in a request for assistance because he has no place to live. He's cooking on the streets. There's no gas. He has to build a fire outside. Whatever food he can get, uh, access to food he can get, uh, with the help of the funds he's been receiving from Share Your Care, uh, he purchases some food and he cooks on a fire outside. And of course, as all of you know right now, winter is approaching and uh, a lot of places there's been a loss of electricity and even in some of our temples devotees need electricity uh to just to, to get water generators are required and uh this is a, which is a new need which has recently evolved recently developed is the need for some generators in some of the temples so this is something that's happening i mean it's it's current <laughs> it's not something that you know that happens at the beginning of the conflict it's 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 continuous uh, it, uh, uh, activity and needs and uh, the devotees they take all these requests that come in regularly they go through the sheet and they disperse funds uh, to the uh, individuals or families to different ways they get through these funds to them so that they can at least uh, maintain themselves uh, at this particular time. But uh, as winter approaches, uh, it's going to become even much more difficult. Uh, as, as all of you know, the European energy crisis and Ukraine is, I, I can't imagine how it's going to be for, for devotees who are, how they're going to live with no heat in the winter. I know what Ukrainian winters are like. I've lived through, you know, 33 of them. And, uh, and, but the buildings were always well heated. And if they weren't, I don't know if I would have survived. Uh, I don't know what, it's such a state of unpredictability. It's difficult to say, you know, what's in store for the devotees over the winter. But definitely funds are always needed. And that's the best way they can help. And there's a website which is established. It's called shareyour.care. And uh, devotees throughout the world, I can say, and I, I know that they've already produced so many videos of devotees with folded hands describing their gratitude for the worldwide Vaishnava community. I, I can say thank you, but these are the devotees who are really saying it, you know, saying it from their hearts. <laughs> and there's many videos of there of devotees just expressing their gratitude that they're still, their, their faith, their trust, their their uh, uh, encouragement and their inspiration to go on serving is a result of the of the widespread care. Now, you know, I I can specifically vouch for myself. I I didn't have to raise funds. I've done very little. I'm just in the background. I just tried to facilitate all the devotees who want to do something, and therefore people are calling me. All right, what can I do? What can I do? Tell me what I can do, what I can do. I can, you can do this, you can do that, you can do this. I, I haven't had to do much in the way of fundraising. I, I mean, I, I, some of the GBCs did take an initiative. For instance, Gary Hari Maharaj, he, uh, he asked me if I would do an interview similar to the interview that you requested me to do today. He asked about the history of the Ukraine Yatra. I told him a lot about this evolution. I didn't even know that his intention was to raise funds. I was just telling you about the Ukraine Yatra. And then he asked me, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, and then I left. And then he personally, everyone who was on the Zoom conference, he personally took the initiative. Everyone, hundreds of people present. And thousands, as a result of his initiative, thousands of dollars were sent 
<laughs> to share your care. And uh, I, I, I think it's just a natural desire that devotees have to want to help other devotees who are in need. Uh, and uh, I, so let, me, let, me just take, let me just take a second to clarify because you, you mentioned it once, but the, the website where devotees can go to find out more is shareyour.care. Correct. Again, it's shareyour.care. There is another unaffiliated, also wonderful website called Share Your Care, which Kaladri of North America helps uh, facilitate some support from here to those efforts. But particularly to help with Ukraine, it's shareyour.care. Yes, shareyour.care. And if you go there, you'll see the statistics, the number of devotees who've been given individual financial support, uh, the, the number of families who've been accommodated in Western Ukraine, uh, the number of displays of prashadam that have been distributed to the devotees, uh, and, the, and specifically the cities right now, the places which are on the front lines where some where if communities or individuals or communities wish to adopt them and sponsor them, uh, then their donations can go directly to those communities to, who are who are um, accommodating refugees. It's all there well, on the ship. In some places, like in, you know, in Alaska, Florida, earlier in, in October, I think the eighth of October, they held a sponsor a special one day for Ukraine event. And they raised some money and they got people donating all kinds of clothes and things. So I want to call out appreciation for the Vera, the Vaishnav International Relief Association organized that. And one of the things that they did, and there may be other people also wondering, um, you know, can we collect a bunch of clothes and send them over? You know, when we hear relief efforts, we hear, you know, tents and blankets and, you know, warm clothes and things like that. Is that helpful? And if so, will there be information about that on the website? Or at this point, is, you know, there's a shipping and getting across the border. It's very difficult happen. shipping into Ukraine right now. Very, so very difficult. To, better to send money at this point? Is that, is that at this point in time, it's better to send money. And, uh, and uh, because it's, it's, it, will, it will be used. I mean, everything is accounted for. Um, uh, and... Uh, it, I, I know exactly how much is available now on a day-to-day -day basis, how much is going to the temples, how much is going to individuals. It's all recorded online. And as I said, the 21 devotees are all volunteering their services. Nobody's getting anything for this. It's all going directly to the devotees who require it. And, uh, Marge, we're, getting a couple, we're getting a couple of questions. Devotees are asking a little bit about, you know, the funds and how they're allocated. So they can go to that same website, shareyour.care, to get more information about where the funds are going and, and, and how. Correct. Yeah, it's all there on the site. The site was developed by a, a devotee who who wanted to help. <laughs> and, he's, and he's just, he's so responsive. It's, it's amazing. He's in Mayapur. He just is so responsive to help. Anytime some statistics or information needs to be put, he's right there taking care of it, and he's providing all the information. Marge, we had a specific He's a devotee question. from Russia, by the way. <laughs> we had a specific question. Buddy Rai Swami wanted to ask his hands up here. We, maybe he's got a different question. But um, specifically, he was curious, how much does a generator cost? You know, that sounds like with this winter coming up, that may be the difference between life and death for a few people. It's definitely life and very, very serious illness. So, uh, Anutama, if you can hear me. Is that all yeah, right? Can, can I have a question? Yeah, please. Yeah, I'd like to know how much a generator co would cost, and I'd like to know, um, can we give, in other words, we would send the money, you would buy it, but, you know, if we were... I'd like, them to, I'd like to see if we could fund a couple generators, but it would have to be for a dedicated, in other words, they would need to know, okay, I'm buying a generator and the money would buy that generator. Yes. Is that possible? Absolutely. Definitely it's possible. So how, how much does a generator cost? Well, for instance, in Kiev, many of the brahmacharis had to move back. And the Kiev is a big temple. You, I think you've seen it before. And uh, if the generator for Kiev is the the, uh, the cost for a generator to, to get water, just it's just to keep the water supply going and to provide electricity with. It's already been uh, priced at ten thousand uh, dollars. So for ten thousand dollars, we could buy a generator for the Kiev temple. Uh, definitely. 
Okay, thanks, Marsh. And, and, and you can send it to a, 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 to a nonprofit account, and, and, the, and that nonprofit could probably just purchase it right directly from, the, from your donation, and it would go directly right, to Marsh, the Q Temple. We're on it. Thank you. Thank you, Bunny. Well, hey, hey let's, let's get them, honey. Don't take it yet. <laughs> so then we are understanding that um, that the efforts that devotees have done in other parts of the world really have made a significant contribution in the terms of helping provide for resources and reallocation and supporting families that are there. Marge, I know you had a video that you said you might be able to share with us. We didn't get a chance to, to test the technology before we, we went live. And is that something maybe we can try to show this time? I think they Yeah, it's a, a short video. video. I think I could probably show it. Um, okay, let's, try let's see if that works. Okay. Let me see if I can get it online. I just should. I'm sorry. Oh, while you're doing that, could you estimate, for instance, the idea of, of, of donating a generator how many major centers with deities and devotee residents would there be for additional generators? Well, so, well some of the centers have had, had to close uh, because uh, uh, they're one of the centers, for instance, in Dnipropetrovsk, which is now known as Dnipro, is, uh, is near a military installation and it's, the train station is right down the street. And uh, it's been closed, the deities have been moved Although devotees, small numbers of devotees do gather there, uh, and other temples have been closed, uh, operations are still going on in Kharkiv. Uh, although it's, and that would be another temple. Uh, Avinitsa Temple uh, is another temple that's just quite active. I would say for active temples, uh, maybe five, five or six, which are still devotees are gathering in active temples where generators could be required, depending on where the next strike on the infrastructure is going to be, you know. But Kiev, as you all know, I mean, I I was talking to devotees in Kiev just a couple of days ago, and uh, they say that you know, electricity is is sparse; uh, they don't have it, and water supplies are also been heavily affected in Kiev. Well, if, if I provide generators, I mean, just so we get a sensor because we're so far away. I mean, can you buy other fuel? I mean, generators don't burn don't burn air. You know, is 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 there gas or diesel or whatever? Yes, it it's available. It's available. I mean, I was as I said, I was just there last week, and uh, in 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 most of the places, the 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 economy is is working, but it's crippled. Uh, and and uh, but there is gas available, and. Uh, but I can't say what's happening on, on the front lines. Nobody knows what's happening on the front lines. And uh, I do hear some stories of the devotees who are fleeing and need to flee uh, because the situation is very desperate. And I can't speak for those smaller communities. But as far as the larger ones are concerned, yes, petrol is still available and it would be available. But what they would have to do is purchase it and store it they would not only have to buy uh, generators, but they would have to buy storage cans to store the containers of petrol because it's not always easily accessible. They would have to get a large supply and store it, which would be additional costs, but it, it can be gotten. Any luck with the video, Maharaj? Or, or oh yeah, I, I sorry, uh, uh, luck with the video. I just hope I can, Somehow it's not coming up. I'm not sure why. Let me, one more thing here. I do have it and I'm pretty sure I can get it to go, but I just need to, I guess my connection is a little bit slow for some reason. There's a lot of things open here. For more than eight months, a war has been going on in Ukraine. Devotees keep asking us for help. The devotees in the occupied cities and towns on the front line are facing the worst situation. The economy is not operational there, and it is close to impossible for them to support themselves. Many devotees need to be evacuated. 
you might be asking how to help Ukrainian devotees. Share Your Care Fund is the tool you can use to do this. Main objectives of the project Helping devotees and their families relocate from conflict zones Help support devotees who are unable to maintain themselves Supporting brahmacharis D. De Seva Food Relief From the 27th of February till the 31st of October 2,796 devotees have received individual financial aid 451 devotees have been given shelter in communities with support. On our website, you can choose one of the Ukrainian Yatras and take care of such a Yatra on your own or jointly as a whole community. For example, you can take care of the New Mayapur community, where more than 100 devotees fleeing the war have found shelter. Moreover, you can find information on most urgent situations such as evacuating from a war zone or a surgery. Now, the following devotees appeal for our help in urgent matters. Mataji Olena, whose husband was killed fighting on the front line. She has a nine-month-old baby and lives in a different city as a displaced person. Ruslan Prabhu and his family, who have survived the hell of Mariupol, a shell hit their house. They are forced to get settled in a new place. Devotees from the frontline town of Bakhmut. They have neither electricity nor gas. They are forced to spend most of their time in the basement hiding from shelling. The fund was established on the initiative of Achyuta Priya Prabhu, ISKCON Regional Secretary for Ukraine and Moldova, and Niranjana Swami, GBC representative for Ukraine. Even a small contribution from each of us can save the devotees' lives. Serving the devotees, your Share Your Care team. Thank you, Maharaj. Very, very moving and informative. We had, uh, I hope everyone can hear me now if we're back. There was uh, one question specifically, and I, I think this was explained in the video, but if a devotee is interested in helping to support a particular family, you know, that one woman with her, with her nine-month-old child, they can go to that site and they can give for specific uh, projects and, and individuals who'd like to help. Yes. In fact, that's already been done many times. There was a devotee who acquired emergency surgery. Oops, wait a minute. Excuse me. I forgot to turn off the uh, uh, devotee required emergency. And and uh, d d people donated specifically for his uh, his surgery and for his uh, his uh, recovery. And they gave even more than was asked, but the, all that was given to him because he was going to be out of work for quite some time. That was one of so many examples of devotees. It goes directly to the to the to the person who requires assistance, financial assistance, if somebody donates directly to them. Maraj, let me ask you a little bit kind of a, not, not so much a, a you know generator and send money kind of question, but I think a lot of us would also be concerned. And I know from your presentations to the GBC in the past that you know there's been a lot of emotional, spiritual pressure and, and, and you know challenges to the devotees. So tell us a little bit if you can, you know, how, how have you been able to assist devotees and, and what, what's giving them the strength to go on? I mean, a lot of us that live in countries that haven't had war and haven't gone through the type of, you know, crisis that the Ukrainian devotees are facing, you know, it, it's, you know, we, we struggle with our day to day challenges as we're quite minuscule in comparison. So, you know, share some thoughts with us if you could, you know, how, how are the devotees finding the strength to go on? And what, do you, what, what are you saying to them? What, what are you going to choose to pray to other leaders? How, how are you encouraging them in the midst of such such crisis? Well, I'll tell you what I'm saying, what a Chuta Priya is saying the most. I mean, I have given lectures to the Ukraine devotees, and I've discussed these points with them and uh, about how to deal with these 
uh, unforeseen circumstances. And, and I tried to make it philosophical, philosophical for sure. And, uh, but for what I've seen that the, what's been most effective for keep, from keeping the devotees strong, making them resilient is camaraderie. And uh, they have relationships. They've learned how to have relationships with their peers. They've learned how to respect elders. They've learned how to approach senior devotees. And, and there are devotees who've been not only trained, but who are naturally inclined because they're feeling sheltered to help other devotees. So because it's community and camaraderie is still going on, even in the midst of all of this that's happening to them, they're, they're keeping it together amongst themselves because that's what they've learned. They've, they've, been, they've learned it from the beginning. They've grown up in their Krishna consciousness with that mood of camaraderie, associ regular association, friendship, having prasadam together, studying philosophy together, uh, revealing on their minds in confidence. The dati patigrinati guyama kyati pichati. It's all manifest in, the, in their lives with each other. So they have each other. And I'd say my observation is that's been reminding the devotees of what they have, <laughs> and which has been coming from me. And what the Chucha Priya is not only reminding them, but he's right there and he's doing it. <laughs> so that's, that's what's giving the devotees a sense of, uh, of hope. Because despite the, the difficulties they're confronting, they're, uh, that, there, as a, there's a sense of uh, care and, uh, and Krishna consciousness, which is a focus of their lives, which is, uh, of course, is ultimately what's going to help anybody in a difficult situation. What it really comes down to is sometimes, you know, devotees have learned how to put up their hands like Draupadi and say, hey, Govinda, you know, there's not, not much else they can do, but now they're doing it together. And, uh, and, uh, and because they're doing it together and they do it regularly together, I'd say that's their greatest strength. And I'm just so grateful that they've learned it. And uh, I guess that's the best way to respond to your question. Uh, that, that's beautiful. I think that's something we, uh, uh, the rest of us, globally can apply. We, you know, hopefully, no more of us will face that kind of intense crisis. But uh, this world's full of one crisis after another. Learning from our, our, our God brothers and God sisters in Ukraine is, is helpful. Maraj, uh, Vanya Raimaraj put up an interesting comment. He said, "I saw Ukraine is in the top spot on the latest World Sankirtan newsletter. What's the story behind that? And they tell us devotees are going out, distributing books." And, are there Hari Nam parties still going on? Prashad distribution? How is this miracle within within a crisis happening? Well, devotees have really got been. I mean, they all know it was Prabhupada's books that got them started, and they all know that their future is in Prabhupada's books. That's what that's in their blood, and uh, they're printing and preparing printing of Ukrainian books in Ukraine. Uh, uh, there's a devotee there who's a printer, and he's actually. Working with the Northeast BBT and uh, and and uh, and working on, we have a put together a whole team of Ukrainian translators because Ukrainian books are going to be required for the future. Again, this is the mastermind of Achyuta Priya Prabhu, and I'm just getting behind him in, in his his uh, his vision. And uh, and there are devotees in the western parts of Ukraine and in Kiev. In fact, I th I sent a. I sent a few pictures to uh, to Dandavats, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, uh, of a devotee who sent me pictures who was distributing books right on the spot, which was in the news when the missile landed in Kiev. He goes out there every day and he distributes books. And, uh, and he sends me his Sankatan stories every, like, like twice a week, his book distribution stories. And he's telling me like how amazing it is, how appreciative people are are for getting Srila Prabhupada's books. And there's some devotees who are still doing it. In fact, this devotee who sends me these reports when I was in America just last, uh, I left America, I think a little over a week or two, two weeks ago, I found out in a box, I had my altar that I used on traveling Sankirtan in 1974, 75 and 76. 
it was a little altar that I used, a bunch of tatua, and you know, we were, back in those days, we were all in our vans, and our temples were vans. And uh, I found the altar, and I found Prabhupada's picture, and I brought it with me to the festival last week, and I gave it to the book distributors and say, here, here's something to, to meditate on. For, and when you go out and book distribution every day. So they are still distributing books, but certainly not in the numbers that used to be like before. But there are devotees who are still going, and there's still devotees who are planning and preparing for the future to go out and distribute books. And food distribution, of course, is going on in all the major cities. All the major cities. That, that's Food for Life is going on, and it's been going on it's very, ever since the very beginning. And, uh, and that's, of course, a separate fund that uh, they, they do their fundraising because it's, it's a broader outreach to other people who are more inclined to distribute food. So the, their Food for Life programs are being funded mostly from out, out their outreach areas and, uh, and from devotees as well. There are some devotees who feel very inclined uh, to help sponsor food distribution in Ukraine as well. So that's going on. Hari Nams, no. Although we did have a retreat, as I mentioned, 850 devotees attended the retreat we had in the Karpatian Mountains last week. And by donations that I received, I was able to sponsor uh, with those donations about 150 devotees who otherwise would have never been able to come. And others who were able to come at least get paid for transportation. We had the, in the usual Bhakti Sangama festival style, people just gave donations to, to pay for, for, uh, for food. We had feasts. We had uh, every day devotees cooking. In fact, I have about, about 300 pictures on my side of that event. And uh, needless to say, there were a lot of tears of gratitude to have that opportunity. Bhakti Vaibhava Maharaj was there. Madhavananda Prabhu also was there. And, uh, and we're looking forward to the next time when we can do something like that. But it's not easy. It's a risk. Uh, when I was in Lviv for John Mastami and Vyasa Puja, the air raid sirens were going off constantly. And the Chutapriya and I had discussed what to do under those circumstances, and there were no basements to go through. So we decided that Kirtan was the best shelter. <laughs> but uh, Marge, I, I'd like to keep uh, the awareness is uh, alive in North America. I run the, the Google group with our 120 uh, centers. I wonder if there's a weekly newsletter or update that we could get that I could post on a regular basis to keep the devotees aware and informed. Kalaji Prabhu, I can't thank you enough for asking that question. I've, I also requested the Share Your Care team to produce newsletters. They're working so hard, it's hard for me to push them, you know, and uh, and they did produce a few of them, but they haven't come out with the kind of frequency that I hoped for. But now with your words and, and your initiative, I can f I can repeat your request and, and, and I'll try to see there is a devotee in Canada who produces them and sends them out. Uh, he's, he lives in Ottawa, but the, he needs the material from the devotees who are inside Ukraine. So I will remind them and tell them that you're eager to have such a newsletter. And uh, let's see if we, it can go out and, 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 and would be sent directly to you. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll begin working on that immediately. Marge, you can also mention them. I know in the early days and weeks and months, the ISKCON News was publishing regular updates. We we're getting, I think, almost weekly. So those can be shared. We'll certainly yes. those. And those uh, I'll... All gratitude goes to you and to Prabhu. The devotees are definitely are thankful for all that this kind of news has done for promoting their needs as well as Dandavats. Uh, actually, I have a whole list of, of different projects globally that I, I wanted to give an honorable mention to, but uh, <laughs> definitely Iskan news and Dandavats is one. And, uh, and certainly uh, Vera was another project that I know the devotees and Alatra are working and helping towards that. And many GBC mem members have come forward, as I said in the beginning, and asking how can we help. And uh, uh, I can, if I, 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 I know I've missed some, but uh, definitely I remember that ISKCON News was there on the list. 
Well, you mentioned some other very important ones like beer. I was down there for the beer event. The devotees worked very, very hard to try to raise awareness. Oh, yeah. I, there was once, the devotees I wish to mention. There, and the, when this conflict first started, the devotees in Chicago, Sri Guru Charana Padma and Raj Mohan, who have a non profit, and they opened up their site and their non profit to receive funds. For the, everybody wanted to give donations, but they want to give to a non profit. And by, they worked so hard, so hard, tirelessly, tirelessly. I was on the phone with Sri Guru constantly. She was staying up late at night. And, uh, and, she, and in the beginning, she was uh, really a major player. And at some point, we realized that we have to give her a break. And we, we moved to other venues and uh, let them go on with other. But... She's another devotee, and her husband Raj Mohan were very instrumental in helping at the, at the beginning of this effort. And there are more. I'm sure I've forgotten some. Forgive, please forgive me if if I haven't covered everybody. But uh, a lot, a, it's a, a, lot a, people, a lot of people have helped, and and, and they're, I think, and they're they're especially hearing from you, Maharaj, about the struggles of devotees and how they're stepping up. And as Bhandi and Ryan Maharaj pointed out, you know, they're still trying to steer books and some of the Prashad and Dishan's going on. It really inspires us. Maharaj, just maybe one, one, one final question, perhaps so if, if people want to put some more up there, you can. But a um, question, I mean, in a broader sense, you know, you were traveling all over the former Soviet Union. Um, you've got devotees that look to you for instruction and guidance and disciples in various places. And, you know, we see... The kind of sectarianism and, 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 and polarization that's coming up, you know, we're, we're one week away from elections here in the United States. And, you know, it, it's downright kind of nasty all over the world in terms of identity politics. And, you know, just this, that, you know, Bhagavad Gita, you know, first instruction, you're not that body. How, how do you, as a spiritual leader, how do you encourage us to overcome those types of pressures that may come from the communities around us or from our own minds or different conceptions to, to you know, stay together, united as, as Vaishnavas and, and to not kind of succumb to these kind of sectarian ideas that sometimes are propagated on social media and other places. But how, how do you shine the light to get rid of our ignorance on that, Marsh? Well, I can only say, speaking from my, my own experience, is that I really try to... As there's a purport in the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, where Srila Prabhupada, fifth chapter, um, fifth canto, maybe, I can't remember which chapter it is, but it's a beautiful purport. Prabhupada talks about, it's a verse that talks about the, the how anybody who takes up the hearing the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, even in personalist, beca can become devotees of the Lord. And Prabhupada says, it, and our Krishna consciousness movement, devotees have, no time for discussions about politics, current events, and uh, and uh, as sociology and some he lists a whole list of things. He said and he says these things will go their own way. He said the devotees, <laughs> his exact words. He said these things will go their own way. The devotees should be utilizing their time for discussing Krishna consciousness and make their lives successful. That's kind of like the essence of his message. I realize that to some degree there'll be many devotees who won't be satisfied with that kind of answer, and uh, they'll say that these things need to be discussed. Uh, I but be I believe that social media, like anything else, can be utilized for Krishna's services. But I've also seen how it's very destructive, and unfortunately, I observe that so, too many people get into too much social topics and don't use it for its real value as using it for Krishna consciousness. I believe if devotees were a little bit more conscientious about that and utilizing it for giving a, a solid Krishna conscious message that's not sectarian, and uh, and I believe that's at least I shine a little light on something to help help avoid this disastrous result of conflict in the material world. I've tried to avoid these discussing these topics, and you know, I, and I feel that the best way that devotees can actually do something is by doing something. <laughs> and besides just being vocal about social issues, there are people suffering. And Prabhupada says, when people are suffering, we should be thinking about how to relieve their suffering. Of course, Krishna consciousness is the best way, but we shouldn't simply idly stand by 
and watch other people suffering wherever they may be. I, you know, I, I've, I've raised funds not only for devotees in Ukraine, but I've sent funds to devotees in Russia also and, uh, and uh, in, in, in other areas because Nobody has nobody has an exclusive claim to suffering in the material world. Krishna clearly says it's from the highest planet to the lowest planet. It's not in this country or that country. It's everywhere, and nobody can claim exclusive right for suffering. So we should care and try to do the best we can to help relieve others' suffering. And uh, try to remember what Prabhupada said: Krishna consciousness is the best method. <laughs> And uh, do whatever we can to contribute to that and to avoid harsh words that will cause others pain. I oftentimes, I oftentimes reflect, and I'll end with this one. It's Srila Jiva Goswami in his Bhakti Sandarbha. He gives a, a, a he quotes a, a reference. He describes what is disrespect for other living entities. And he quotes a verse from the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. He says that sharp arrows that pierce the chest and approach the heart are not as painful as the insulting words of a materialist, which pierces the chest, be, enters the heart and becomes lodged there. He describes that such harsh words that cause pain, to willingly cause pain to others with sharp words. He said, this is much more painful than the arrow that enters the chest and approaches the heart. And he defines this as one of the verses he uses as disrespect. I think devotees have to become conscious of what the things that they say that is causing pain to others. And nobody should ever say anything that willfully causes pain to others. That's the best message I can give for that. Thank you, Maharaj. That's beautiful. Uh, Damodar Prabhu, who's helping with a technical background, he put up on the screen that the verse you quoted is from 5, 12, 13. Uh -huh. that Yes, 5, 12, 13, yes. yes. 5, 12, 13, folks will look it up. And if I may, Maraj, just to, 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 to further add some uh, emphasis on what you said, there's a short quote from Bhaktino Thakur, I think that's very connected to this. This is from the Sri Tattva Sutram 35. He writes, those who think that devotion to God and kindness to the jivas are mutually different from each other and perform accordingly in their life, such persons will not be able to follow the devotional culture. Their performance is only a semblance of devotion. Therefore, all kinds, all the, all the types of beneficence to others, like kindness, friendliness, forgiveness, charity, respect. He didn't say uh, uh, um, generators, but we probably would have included that if he was running that today. Are included in, in bhakti, charity of medicines, clothes, food, water, etc., shelter during adversities, teaching of academic and spiritual education, etc., are the activities included in the devotional culture. So just a little additional emphasis of our acharyas are saying that, you know, we, we, we have to take care of the soul and the mind and the body, especially when our Vaishnava brothers and sisters are in distress. Thank you so much for that quote. Can I ask where that quote is from? Yeah, it's, it's from the uh, Sri Tattva Sutram 35. Thank Shri you. Tattva Sutra. 35. 35. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. And thank you for being with us. I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. It's been about 75 minutes. Unless you have additional final comments you'd like to make, Maharaj? Uh, only comments uh, uh, is just to thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to speak on behalf of the devotees living in Ukraine. And, uh, uh, and uh, I just encourage devotees uh, to uh, find out what ways that you can possibly do. I've, I, of course, I've given the focus as uh, your funds will always be used and always be helped. But uh, any kind words that you can say to help or to care or to mention about the devotees and their struggles, I believe that will also be a very great contribution. And I can say on behalf of these devotees, their hearts, their hearts are, are melted by the Vaishnava community. And... Uh, I don't, I don't know how I can express it with a few words like thank you, but uh, I'm sure someday that they will express it in ways much better than I can. Marsh, if devotees listening want to, you know, send some of these, uh, you know, express their concern, their love, their, their, their worry, you know, their, their heartfelt desires for the devotees in Ukraine, 
Is there a place like on the website, shareyour.com, where they can put some comments up to be shared? Or how can we send them those messages that you've told us are so encouraging for them? Uh, well, will this be on YouTube? Yes, it's, it, well, it's on YouTube right now, and I think, Domino, aren't we going to be recording this and keeping it up there? For if you're going to keep it up on YouTube, they can just write their comments on YouTube, and I will personally take those comments and share them with the devotees, for, at least for now. It will take some time to get them on the Share Your Care site. Unfortunately, I have a, a particular fear about social media, <laughs> that sometimes I see it's abused, and I, I, I don't want to have to... I don't want to have to start, you know, uh, uh, with censoring <laughs> some of the comments. So I, I, I don't, I'm not completely sure the devotees will want to put a place for comments on Share Your Care. I will have to discuss it with them. It's their initiative, and I don't want to make the decision for them. But at least, well, this at, least now, at least for now, we can we can make our prayers and, and send our comments in in our hearts and among ourselves, and and and, and, and your comments on YouTube on YouTube, on this video, on this video, and I, I will take from there and I will share it with the other devotees. And I'll see if the Share Your Care team wishes to open it up uh, on the site for comments like that. I will discuss it with them. I have a couple of takeaways here that I have to work on. One of them is the newsletter, and then the other is uh, about opening up comments on the website. Raj, a lot of other comments from listeners. Thank you very much for sharing the latest news about the Ukraine devotees. Let us all continue to remain united to assist them. Uh, thank you for the support and the help. Hearts are melting just by hearing more about our devotee college in Ukraine. So again, thank you very much, Maraj, and, and, and maybe we can do this in a few more months and hopefully celebrate the end of this conflict. And, <laughs> I, um, I, would, I would love to do that. <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks so thank to you. you. Thank, you to thank you to devotees in North America, Kaladri and the North American Council that organized this event. Thank you, Dominar Prabhu, for, for being working on the technical aspects behind it. And thanks for the, uh, I think, 100 or so devotees that have joined us on YouTube and those that will be listening to this in the future. And many, many prayers for the leaders and all of the devotees in Ukraine. And, and we pray that Krishna will protect each and every one of them. Thank, thank you, Mr. Prabhu. And thank you to all the devotees attending this also as well. For your interest and concerns. Hare Krishna. Glory to Prabhupada.